In today's show, we're talking New Orleans Pelicans with the host of the Locked On Pelicans podcast, Jake Madison. Michael Bolton, he's here as well. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. We're talking Pelicans today, and today's show is brought to you by Rock Auto. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Visit rockauto.com and tell them that Locked On sent you. So we're going to talk Pelicans. We might as well bring in the host of the Locked On Pelicans podcast. All right, so here he is, the host of the Locked On Pelicans podcast. Jake Madison is here with me. Jake, welcome back to the show. Of course, thanks for having me on, Josh. It's good to have you here. It's good to uh, good to have you here to talk Pelicans, a team obviously with a lot of changes this uh, this off season. So uh, let's let's get into that now. But as we start all these shows, I ask all of these hosts to tell me what they think their opening night projected starting five is going to be. I don't think there's too much consternation with the Pelicans, but uh, but let me know. Yeah, like that that's about what I think. You know, they're they're a tough team to kind of figure out what they're going to do and what the rotation's going to look like, but you know, the biggest question mark might be Nikhil Alexander-Walker, but given the way that David Griffin has talked about him a lot recently, it seems like that's the guy to kind of pencil in right now, I think. Well, there was that that report last year that yeah, Griffin was perhaps unhappy with Van Gundy not giving minutes to Alexander Walker and uh, to, I guess, a lesser extent, Kyra Lewis. So I think with that, the absence of Bledsoe and Lonzo Ball that he would slide in, you would assume that Devontae Graham is going to get that job and then Ingram, Zion, they're yeah, absolute locks and Jonas Valanciunas just comes in and replaces Steven Adams. Yeah, to me, that, that only real pressure point, I guess, is the Alexander Walker or Josh Hart. But yeah, I think Hart probably functions better as a sixth man as he's played basically the entirety of his career in uh, in New Orleans in that role. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's the guy they like coming off the bench that, you know, it has a rebounding advantage against second units at times in different groups like that and can kind of just do his thing and out hustle them. You know, I, I think you could make an argument maybe for Devontae Graham coming off the bench and kind of being that go-to scoring six man, maybe for new Orleans, but given you gave up the first round pick, you're paying him that money. Like, and you want more shooting around Zion, right? Like that's a big part of it too. Like it feels like he should be in the starting lineup, but again, with a new head coach coming in a front office, that's going to have their hands in a lot of the rotation decisions and lineups and things like that. It, it's tough to kind of figure out right now. You know, I, I think like this starting lineup, Zion's going to be there. Valanciunas is going to be there. B.I. is going to be there. But like the backcourt could be in pencil, I think. So that, that's interesting. I would have said Graham is definitely going to start. Now, his ability to take threes is really important. He doesn't hit twos at all. Like he's horrendous as a two-point shooter, but his three-point <laughs> shooting is pretty good. And that's fine. Like if he goes out there and takes eight threes a game, hits three and a half of them or three a game, like that's, that's a pretty good result uh, to have him out there. But if he didn't start, I, I wouldn't have. Uh, yeah, it didn't really enter my head. Like, I would have hoped that Kyra Lewis would get that opportunity, but who do you think they would put into that position? Would they try and you know, shoehorn Alexander Walker, who is definitely not a point guard, into the point guard role? Would they put Lewis in there? Would they go with a dependable guy like a Thomas Sadoransky, who's a point guard as well? They got across in the Lonzo Ball deal. Like, what would the other option be? Yeah, like that's kind of what I, it, that's the thing. I don't know, right? Like, what's Willie Green going to look at with this roster and feel comfortable with? Is a first year head coach going to come in and go, hey, I'm going to ride kind of the veteran, right? Sadoransky is the safest choice probably out of all of these to a certain degree, if unspectacular, but a guy that can somewhat run a team gives you good size too. So would he step in maybe, or is, you know, Kyra Lewis Jr. Doesn't seem like he's ready for that full time, right? I want to see him against second units and succeed against those before I would put him into that starting role. Or do they feel they have enough, you know, ball handling through Zion Williamson being basically point Zion full time now, not only part of the year, but B.I. is a pretty good passer and creator. So do they kind of just go with like a lot of secondary ball handlers and hoping that kind of equals like one and a half primary ball handlers? Maybe it just kind of 
depends. Given COVID, we haven't been able to talk to Willie Green much. We haven't seen preseason or training camp, anything like that. I really don't know what they're thinking. You know, they kind of went all in on Point Zion last year. So could you get away with maybe two combo guards in the backcourt? Yeah, that is a possibility. You just put the ball in Ingram and, and Williamson's hands and then see what those other guys do. Just have them spot up and play defense and, uh, and, and be a guy that, that can handle it rather than being the guy that has to do everything on the offensive side. But let, let's talk about a bench rotation because you know, you've given me the, these five names, but there are, there are two names that came across in that Lonzo Ball deal, which you haven't included there. And that's what's really tough about trying to figure out this rotation. So you've gone with Kyra Lewis, Josh Hart, Najee Marshall, Trey Murphy, and Jackson Hayes. But that's no Garrett Temple. That's no Thomas Sutter. Ransky. Um it's it's tough. To, and you, I think majority or at least 50% of Josh Hart's minutes last year came at the three as well. So it's sort of him and Marshall and Murphy who are all sort of threes really with Hart can push to the two and Murphy pushes up to the, to the four at times. So it is a little bit of a weird mix in that bench. Yeah, look, and you could, in in a, in a sense, almost make the case for maybe Najee Marshall needs to start for this team to yeah. some degree, right? At like a two guard spot, given the defense and three point shooting, especially showing it off in summer league. So, it's weird, right? Like I I feel like of all of the people that would be out of the rotation of the names that you mentioned would be Sadaransky just not getting minutes. I think they kind of want to go with the youth movement. They want to give those minutes to Kyra Lewis Jr. And I think even if Willie Green wanted to play Sadaransky. David Griffin's going to override him. And it's going to be like, you're playing Kyra for that, for that kind of role, which is probably the right move to be honest for what this team needs. I think Garrett Temple's kind of just like, depending on what you need, you just need a solid dude out there. That's not going to screw up, but does nothing spectacularly. You'll give him five minutes a game, something like that. So he's a bit of a non-factor and don't forget Billy Hernan Gomez too, right? That's a guy that can easily give you 10 and 10 in, in 20 minutes just by breathing. Does Jackson Hayes and some of the off-court stuff that he's going through right now factor in, and does he lose some rotation minutes to start, or is he not available to start? We don't really know how that's going to kind of shake out. So there's a couple of other guys that I think could kind of crack this, and maybe it's going to be a little bit open-ended to start the year as Willie Green finds his feet and starts to figure these guys out. But I think these are the names that should be getting the most minutes out of all of the bench guys that they have. You mentioned Jackson Hayes and the off-court issues. Are we expecting a suspension? to come in for him, do you think? I, I don't think so. You know, I, just kind of given everything, and look, I, I really don't know. Like, I, I don't feel comfortable commenting it on it either way. It's why I've not really talked about it on my show. You make the case he did some things wrong. You make the case police did things wrong. I have a feeling, if anything, this might be just one of those things that goes away and he had a rough off season because of it. But he was a guy that really started to play well, I thought, towards the second half of last season after an early benching, right? Like he was in the rotation, they benched him, and he seemed to kind of take that from heart and grow as a player and showed off a lot of what you see, what, a, what you want to see out of a guy his size and someone that could pair next to Zion Williamson, I think, to a degree, including a three-point shot of all things. He's a guy they want to have minutes. It's just that's a situation that I don't know how to read and I don't know how it's going to shake out whatsoever so that's kind of an open question when it comes to this rotation too yeah i was going to ask you about his three-point shooting as well because he did start to flash that and if he can do that and you've we've mentioned the fact that david griffin's going to have his uh his hands and his nose just 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 mixing in there with the rotation and he invested at a, a top 10 pick in jackson hayes so you think that if he's going to be pushing uh, one of those backup centers in there it's probably going to be jackson especially if he's shown that ability to fit next to zion which i don't think billy and gomez quite has that uh that fit necessarily down pat given his defensive liabilities and his lack of outside shooting so if hayes can bring that then that fit is uh is really really interesting now jake you're down in New Orleans. Uh, I've been to New Orleans. It's it really honestly. It it feels like an armpit that hasn't used a sweat block wipe. That is how hot and moist and sweaty it is down there. But if your armpits feel like a summertime in New Orleans, sweat block is the answer. It is doctor created. It is doctor recommended. It is the product that you need if you suffer from excessive sweating. And that can be an embarrassing problem whether you're at school presenting in front of your class, you're you're up at work and you got to talk to your boss and there's a swimming pool under your arm. Sweat block's the answer. Wipe it on before you go to bed. Sleep. That's beautiful. Wake up the next morning, have a wash, get get dressed, off you go. That's it. You're done. Up to a week's coverage from excessive sweating. And the dry shirt guarantee is also awesome. If you if it doesn't protect you, you get your money back. Simple as that. And you get 20% off at sweatblock.com, but only if you use our promo code locked on. You can get it at Amazon. You can get it at CVS, but Bezos doesn't need your money. Sweatblock, go direct, get 20% off, sweatblock.com and use the promo code locked on. 
Daily fantasy sports, it can be tough. You know, 85% of people lose playing daily fantasy sports because the game is rigged against you. There are so many people out there, thousands of people playing against you, plus experts with more tools, more time, and more money to invest into it. So that's why we're introducing Stat Hero, the first ever daily fantasy sports book that puts the player in control and winning within reach. Here's how it works. Stat Hero shows you their lineups and dares you to beat them. It's you versus the house in a head-to-head fantasy matchup. You see their lineup. You know what you've got to beat, so you can put your lineup out there to go ahead and get that money. You name the stakes, winner, take all. So go to stathero.com slash locked on. Sign up for free and right now you can get three times back on your first play. They're giving you a 300% match. That is absolutely unheard of. Stathero.com slash locked on. Go to stathero.com slash locked on. Let's have a look at, uh, I was going to say, injury updates. We've already talked about this with Jackson Hayes and his legal issues. We, we don't know where that's going. So let's just move on to the next part of, uh, of this show, Jake. And uh, we'll talk about Willie Green. Stan Van Gundy, the Pelicans played in the, let's see, 1920 season as one of the highest paced teams in the NBA under Alvin Gentry. They were just going uh, hammer and tong. Stan Van Gundy's history as a coach was, we'll slow it down. And he did come down, come in and slow it back down for the Pelicans. They didn't go back to molasses, Tom Thibodeau style um, pace, but they weren't as dynamic and as fast as they were in the past. Do you think that Willie Green, do you have any idea or any inkling based on what he's done or any, any chatter from the team that they're going to you know, ramp that speed back up a little bit to be you know number one in the NBA in terms of pace? Yeah, I, I think they're going to play faster. And again, it comes back to David Griffin, right? Like that, that went so poorly, as poorly as it could have gone with Stan Van Gundy that he's not going to let something like that happen again. He's going to have his hands in so much that he's going to be not a sh- – like, Shadow coach, but but not necessarily not a shadow coach either, I think, kind of, when it comes to this sort of thing. So I think he hired Willie Green with kind of the intention to make them play quicker. It, look, they'll play faster if they get better on defense too, right? If they get their arms in the passing lanes, poke some steals out, and you saw it in Summer League, right? Like they ran in Summer League whenever they got the opportunity to. I think that's going to kind of be their, their MO. I don't know if they'll be top five in pace, but I think top 10 is a reasonable – expectation for this team just based on Willie Green alone and kind of coaching the defense differently than what Stan Van Gundy was doing which was don't guard the three-point line and just let them bomb away and teams weren't missing against New Orleans by playing a more active style of defense I think getting more turnovers creating more opportunities to run and look you've got guys that can do it right Zion can handle the rock and do that so can B.I. you lose Lonzo Ball and that's where he was kind of at his best as a point guard but you've got enough people and the keel's pretty fast Kyra Lewis Jr. is one of the faster guys in the league too all these players want to push the ball up in transition so I expect to see them significantly quicker in terms of pace than they were last season you bring up an interesting point I'm going to get back to pace in a second you talk about David Griffin we've mentioned it so many times about being a shadow coach and people will say to me often because you know, I, I, I will comment on coaches rotations all the time but Josh you know you think you you can be a coach but I don't know that a coach necessarily should be the be all and end all of a rotation or of a or a play style necessarily I, I do believe that a general manager should have input into those sort of things the coach does his his drills and it you know, works on the you know, the technical side and improving skills and you know, some game plan type stuff and calling plays and all that sort of stuff. But in terms of you know, rotation decisions and how players fit together and you know, the, the play style and the way the team is building, I, I don't believe that that should be a coach's you know, purview 100%. I think that a general manager and the way that Griffin would push in and say, well, well this guy needs to get in here and we need to be running this sort of you know, system or, or this pace or slow it down rather than you get the coaches doing more of the nitty-gritty play style and that sort of thing. I do believe a general manager should be having a pretty sizable input on that sort of thing. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I don't actually think this is a bad thing. And I think you're seeing at least 50% of teams in the league kind of have their their top basketball decision makers, what I call it, right? Like, because yeah, yeah. GM's a title, all that stuff. You know, their top basketball decision makers having their hands in this. This is all across the league. You think Daryl Morey's not doing that in oh, Philadelphia, yeah. even with Doc Rivers as the head coach? Like, come on. It, when you look at the preparation, and I've gotten to see some of this, like behind the scenes stuff of the work that front offices do to try and assemble rosters and like these binders of players and data on them. They're, they're signing these guys, trading for these guys, making these moves based on guys they think synergize as well. They're going to tell the coach to play those two guys together or that a guy plays in a certain style better than he does in, in a different one. So, like, they should have their hands in this. I look at coaches now, and John Corrales and I did an episode of Locked on NBA on this, actually. Like, coaches are, what, more managers than maybe – coaches right is that a good way to maybe describe it in in a sense i think to a degree yeah i don't know if, i don't know if the term is managers but it's more like uh like 
interpersonal relationship gurus or something like that. Yeah. Like being able to relate, get mo- motivators, um, um, dealing with They're the like plays. middle management versus like the yeah. CEO of, of the team is kind of what I mean by it. But yeah, I agree with you. So like David Griffin's putting this team together and going, Willie, I want you to coach these guys, but I want you to coach them this way. And Willie Green's brought in because listen to all these players rave about him, right? When you watch the Phoenix Suns last year, that team was really well prepared for whatever the opponent was going to do. And you saw Willie Green lead a lot of their huddles. Those players are fixated on that dude, right? Like they were paying attention to him. That's what I think he's kind of really being brought in for rather than his X's and O's or or anything else. It's as you said, kind of right, like work on the interpersonal relationships, get the buy-in from the players, kind of lift them up is what he's designed to do. Not to, you know, and Clint plays is some of it, right? But not to just do all of the X's and O's himself and then make the team go out and execute that. Yeah, it's just to be able to bring the vision of the front office and the players together and get the best out of every individual player and knowing your player. Like, does this player like to get, like, revved up? Does he like to get, you know, you're really screamed at? Does this player like to be more um, yeah, positive reinforcement? You know, how do you get the best out of your players on a, on a personal level? To me, that's more of a, of, a, of a coach's job along with other stuff rather than this is who must start and play in these positions where that stuff can be decided from from other guys and with other input where the coach has to come in and talk to this guy and go, yeah, Zion, you need to do this or yeah someone else you know using names for example like Devonte graham yeah. might, might like being told you know you're playing shit like do better and he goes oh yeah, fuck you coach i'm going out there i'm going to do it and players respond differently to that and understanding that differential we're getting really sidetracked here but i think that's really where the role of the coach needs to push and it is moving that way in the nba but let's go on to the next question now jake we talked about it already point zion was something that happened last season it worked really really well uh, i thought do we see just m- more of this now is this his full-time role, and we've talked about it. Devontae Graham is a point guard, and he's a pretty good passer, but you, I think you want the ball in Zion's hands as much, if not if not more, than last season. Do you think that, that they will just continue to go you know, all in? Not that he's LeBron, you know, where he is uh, the point guard as a power forward, but yeah, not far off that. No, they're they're going to do more of it. Like it's it's basically going to be full time point Zion, and that's how they're going to use him. Like, look, Devontae Graham's issue as, as a point guard is he doesn't drive, right? Yeah, because he can't like finish. He, he drives about the same amount as as Lonzo Ball does, and that was Lonzo's biggest weakness. Where yes, they have the ball in their hands, but they don't bend that defense or really move that defense when the ball's in their hands, right? They bend it with their they're shooting and being kind of more off ball and a threat. And you've got to keep a guy on them from that. You need someone that bends that defense. And really the only guy that does that consistently and does it incredibly well is Zion Williamson. Dude's insane at the rim. When he has the ball, he can score from anywhere. So you have to account for that. So him being the biggest offensive threat on the perimeter, down low, wherever they get him the ball, you you have to get him the ball and let him create for others because teams otherwise are going to keep throwing two guys on Zion off the ball, sometimes three guys, right? And just deny him. And that's where this offense will entirely fall apart. I really like what Brandon Ingram can do. I actually thought he had a really good last season despite a different role and kind of a sub-optimal shot chart in, in a degree. But he doesn't bend a defense the same way that Zion does. And if he's your biggest threat, yeah, you've got to get him the ball more so than anyone else. So I think you'll see it be primarily point Zion until teams really start to try and counter that and that's not something i'm sure they're going to be able to do effectively well they haven't been able to do it really so far like he, he is the best finisher in the nba and you want the ball in the hands of someone that when they've got it the opposing defense goes oh shit like oh no yeah and where everyone starts because you want panic you want chaos you want to for them to go you know it's all well and good for someone to have it and you go well we know where we're going to sit and we know where this guy's going to go and we sit in our positions that we can guard all this but when zion gets the ball you go oh no like, and then it requires panic. And then guys are like, do I need to come over? Do I need to do I need to switch? Do I need to double team? What do I do? And then there's confusion. And then it leaves guys open. So you want you want the ball in the hands of your own shit player. And that is clearly Zion. For as good of a, a shooter that Ingram has become, for as good of a passer as he's become, for as good as Graham can become, as yeah, trigger happy as Nikhil Alexander-Walker, as a scorer can become, like they're not oh shit players. The oh shit guy is Zion because when he gets it, you know, well, if he gets to the rim, it's over. Um, and now we can pass. And if he develops a shot, then we're in real trouble. And that's that's where the ball needs to go. So I'm really excited to see the direction of this and see if we can get that assist rate really pushing up and opening up the offense for so many of these guys. But Jake, it is that time that people, all, they're all excited for. It's the time where I ask my guest whether they know how to fix their own car. 
Oh, I actually do. I'm a big oh. car guy. I use Rock Auto all the time to order stuff. I've got a 1976 Corvette I'm fixing up right now. Wow. If I knew what cars were, I'm sure that would be super impressive. But 1976 sounds old, so I'm going to assume it's really cool. But we've had a run of hosts who haven't known how to fix their car after my first five or so knowing, and I felt really dumb because I don't know what I'm doing. But Jake, you know that Rock Auto is the place that you can get parts for your 1976 Corvette, whatever make or model your car is. Rock Auto has it for you, and you don't have to pay those exorbitant prices that you would find at a local chain store or a car dealer. So visit rockauto.com. They're an online family business that have been serving auto parts customers for 20 years. Find that brake part, tail lamp, motor oil, even the new carpet that you need for your new or old or classic or daily driver car, whatever it is, Rock Auto has you covered. So go to rockauto.com, find all the parts available for your car and in there, how did you hear about us box? Right, locked on so that they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. Jake, what color is your uh, Corvette? Uh, it is red. So it is literally it like is. the Prince song, of a little red Corvette. Is. Yes, awesome. All right. Um, if you want to see Jake's uh, Jake's Corvette, I'm sure you, I'm sure you can uh, tweet it at him at Nola Jake. There, there's a plug for all the, <laughs> all the car people listening to this. Go and uh, check out his car. All right. Last question for you, um, Jake. How does Jonas Valanciunas fit in? Jonas Vasu Inuansas. Sorry, sorry, Charles. Um, how does how does <laughs> Valanciunas fit in on this team? Because he is very different to Stephen Adams. He's a guy that can be quite useful offensively. He's not probably not quite as good defensively. He's a better shooter than Adams, but he's not necessarily a good or a willing long range shooter. So how is that fit going to be? Is he going to be a thirty minute a night center, or is it going to be that twenty five minute scenario that we saw with Adams? Yeah, I think it's more on the 25-minute mark here. Look, let, let's kind of quash this idea now that he's a court spacer next to Zion Williamson. Yes, he shoots the three ball at a nice percentage, but on basically no volume. And I can probably swap parts out on my car quicker than he can get that shot off. Um, so no one's like guarding him on the perimeter. So let's like kill that idea. Maybe he makes like close to a three per game, but it's not going to like influence very, very much in how they defend Zion Williamson. Look, it's a useful player to have. He's better offensively than Steven Adams is, and it gives another threat for point Zion and a guy that he can kind of jump it off to, but he's not a vertical spacing threat, right? No. Like in the dunker spot, he's nice to have, but you've got to get him the ball through three or four guys and hopefully, you know, not have a turnover happen there. It's not a guy you love the ball up to like say Jackson Hayes who can then throw it down which adds a different kind of type of spacing vertical spacing to the offense that I think they need probably more so than Valanciunas but it's also a guy that if someone's having an off night and he's cooking feed him dude can put up 25 on, on any given night so it's a nice threat to have he is someone defenses need to account for more than Steven Adams I think that's kind of like the extent of it right like nice rebounder a guy that's going to add a lot I like him on the team but if he's scoring a ton of points for the Pelicans, some, something's gone wrong somewhere. And that's that's not what you want to see. It's a nice option to have, but one they really shouldn't be tapping into a whole lot. Is there any chance that we see, barring injury, Jackson Hayes take over that spot this year? You know, so going into this year before Valanciunas coming in and trying to figure out what they were going to do with Steven Adams, I wouldn't have been shocked if they tried to dump Adams role with say like Billy Hernan Gomez for half the season until Jackson Hayes was ready to kind of step into that. It feels like he needs another half season or so before you really trust him in that spot. But yeah, like that, that's the long-term starter. Valanciunas, I think is an expiring off the top of my yeah, head. So it's a guy that's like going to be a one season thing. They're not going to bring him back after this year. They might even try and trade him this year. If it looks like Jackson Hayes is ready, Jackson Hayes is not a perfect fit next to Zion, but for a seven foot springy center like that, who's a vertical spacing threat, right? That lob threat that Zion can get it up to. And you've now got to account for that guy and body him up in the dunker spot, which you don't necessarily need to do for Valanciunas. That adds another dimension to the point Zion experience, let alone the fact that he's willing to step. He steps into that three shot confidently, something that he's clearly been working on with coaches, Jackson Hayes. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if Hayes impresses enough early on in the season in his bench role that they're like, we've got to kind of give this guy a shot, particularly if Valanciunas isn't really being used. You could let Valanciunas try and cook, uh, you know, with second units and kind of be the focal point of that. He's a guy that I think could succeed in a type of role like that. I just don't think Hayes is ready for it at the start of the year. But as the season goes on, like that's who I expect to be the starting center next season. And it wouldn't shock me if he gets that nod at certain points this year. How about this then? Because um, I love talking to you so much, Jake. I've got an, an, a bonus question. Um, you say they decide that yeah, they do need a bit more shooting in there. Could Zion 
be a starting center on this team and you throw in a 6'9", Trey Murphy, a Najee Marshall into that starting lineup with more wings and have Zion be really that non-shooter in the lineup and then get you know, bombers like, like Murphy, who legitimately, if he played 30 minutes, could get up eight, nine threes a game. You're realistically, within a 70, 80% three-point attempt rate. Someone like that in there, is that any is there any hope that that could be uh, a move that is viable as a, yeah, not a majority of the game, but for decent chunks of it? It, I guarantee you they're going to try something like that. It, it, and this might also depend more on Trey Murphy than Zion Williamson, I think, because when you looked at Murphy in Summer League, he he defended Evan Mobley yeah. nice. and, and did an incredible job on him, right? For being undersized against the, what, number four overall pick, whatever he was, this big bruising center, he held him to a bad game. If he can do that at the NBA level, that unlocks a different dimension for this Pelicans team. And you don't need to worry about Zion, who's a liability defensively, guarding some of these centers and, and issues that arise from that. And so that's something I think the Pelicans might really look at. I don't, I don't know if they can do that just yet. I'd like for them to try. It, it seems like that's what they should do, right? Like this seems like a, not Anthony Davis not wanting to play the five, even though he should, but it seems like eventually... If Zion can rebound at a decent enough clip, and maybe there's a bit of an issue with that because he is undersized too, and he's a better offensive rebounder than a defensive rebounder. If they can find a way to play with him kind of as that as the five, right, and put four shooters around him, that's the, that's the dream, is, yeah. is four shooters around Zion Williamson and give him all of the space in a way you never were able to give Anthony Davis and see what can happen because I don't know how anyone in the league is supposed to defend that. It comes to down, uh, what can the Pelicans do defensively with a lineup like that? That I'm not sure yet, but if Trey Murphy can actually guard centers, which means he can guard fours, yeah, like sign me up for, for trying that out a bunch. It'd be really interesting to see if they do uh, go that direction at all this season. Jake, that'll do it for us today. Of course, all the Pelicans news, you're going to have it covered for us all over on Locked On Pelicans five days a week. Thank you for coming on and, uh, and chatting about the Pelicans with us. Of course. Thanks for having me on, Josh. And that'll do it for today's show. Don't forget to follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app on YouTube. Thumbs up, leave a comment, ring the notification bell. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.